Okay, if you think about what we've been talking about the past week or so, we've been talking a lot about synchronization. We talked about semaphores, we talked about atomics, and so on. And we really haven't been talking about threading very much. We're now going to get back to the threading part, and we're going to start discussing something called the Java Executor Framework. And I'll talk about the Java Executor Framework briefly here. It's a, a vast topic. In fact, this giant uh, class diagram that you see here is only a piece of the executor framework. So it's this, this monstrosity of uh, tangled stuff. It's really cool. And I'll talk briefly about the types of thread pools that are supported by the Java executor framework, which is what we're going to care about for our next assignment. And I'll give you a real quick human known use of thread pools that you've probably all dealt with at one point along the way. So what's the executor framework? It's basically a whole collection of classes and interfaces that, when all is said and done, help to decouple the creation and management of threads, and thus concurrent execution, from the application logic that has various tasks that are to be performed. So it's about separating the work to do from the means by which the work is done concurrently. The mechanisms that are provided in the executor framework, of which you can see there's quite a bit, right? This, this giant framework, they're actually provided through uh, something called the executors class, which is essentially a facade. And as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of factory methods in this facade. And these factory methods create different kinds of thread pools. And we'll talk more about what thread pools are uh, shortly. So what is a thread pool? Well, essentially, a thread pool is a group of threads that are used to run computations. And why do we need them? And the reason we need them is because concurrent programs often, though not always, have to handle a large number of clients. So imagine a, a high-performance web server that's got thousands of client requests that are being processed simultaneously. Spawning a thread for each client doesn't really scale, right? You'll end up with just an unbelievably large number of threads. And um, so that the reason it doesn't scale is because you end up having lots of overhead to try to keep track of all the threads. It ends up consuming enormous amounts of memory for all the threads. Each thread typically uses about a mega Byte versus, uh, a megabyte worth of virtual memory, which starts to become large over time. And so you'll typically run out of uh, threads if you make a new thread for each client request. So instead of doing that, a better way to do things is often to have a pool of threads. And that allows you to scale up the performance better. And why it works is because it amortizes the memory processing and uh, memory and processing overhead that are associated with spawning a thread for each request. How big the pool should be depends on various factors. Predominantly depends on how many cores you have, A, and what kind of workload you're doing, whether it be CPU bound or uh, I.O. bound. And if you read this article, I believe it's an article by Brian Getz, where he gives you a little formula for computing uh, what the size of the thread pool should be as a heuristic. <laughs> The Java Executor Service Framework has several types of thread pools that it supports. It has what's called a fixed size pool, where you have a fixed number of threads you create when you make the pool. And then when you execute the request, when you, you give work to the pool, if you have more work than there are threads in the pool, they're simply queued up to be run when one of the threads in the pool is available to do something new. Another kind of pool is what's called a cached thread pool. As you can see, you say new cached thread pool. You don't give a number to begin with. And so when you execute a request on a new cached thread pool, what it'll do is it will spawn new threads for each time you call a request. Um, but those threads will be removed if they're not used for a certain amount of time. So this is useful for uh, applications that have bursts of threads and then they can go ahead and kind of go back down. The other kind of pool we have are what's called a fork join pool. And this is what supports work stealing. We'll talk more about work stealing later. Those are work stealing queues that are used to maximize processor core utilization. So we have this thing called a work stealing pool. And the size of this pool defaults to all the available processor cores as its target parallelism level. And we'll talk more about what that means as well. There's also other ways to implement thread pools. I've written various papers and books that talk about some other ways. Don't worry too much about them right now. They're just alternative ways of being able to make things run concurrently. 
What's the human known use of thread pool? Well, my favorite example is a call center, right? So you call up, you know, you have, you're having problems with your tax returns, you're having, you wanna, you know, book a flight and you wanna call an airline, you're having problems with your credit card, you know, whatever it is, you call the, you call the IRS, they have a long queue when you do that. And there's a bunch of operators standing by and they basically have a pool of operators. So as, you know, they don't have, every time you make a call to a call center, they don't run out in the street and grab someone and bring them in to have them answer the phone, right? They have a fixed size pool, maybe, you know, 20 people or whatnot. And anybody beyond the 20 people goes into a queue and then you get the little, you know, Muzak playing or something. So that's a good example of a, of a human known use of a thread pool as a call center. Okay, so that's basically the end of that.